It's a great pleasure to introduce to you Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who is Professor of Computer Science at the University of Oxford and Principal of the Jesus College and also co-founder and chairman of the Open Data Institute. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. To start at a more general level, uh, we just have conducted a study where we have asked people in Europe, but also in China and India and the US, for example, for their, um, what they feel about future technologies and, this, and AI in particular. And uh, we have found out the obvious, that the Europeans are more scared and that the US and the people in China are more affirmative and open for future technologies. Why do you think this is the case? Well, it's kind of interesting because actually historically um, AI has very deep roots in Europe and uh, some of the very first thought experiments and the first computers of course developed in the UK by people like Turing uh, and strong AI traditions in France and Germany, Holland, Netherlands and, uh, and in the UK. Um, but I guess it's because perhaps the Europeans are always looking at the potential social implications. It goes right back I think to uh, to kind of considerations from the Enlightenment, you know, what is this going to do to human happiness and personal autonomy or power and the state uh, or jobs and freedom? Um, and uh, I, think, I think there perhaps is a, a narrative that is more reflective. I don't think they should be worried. I don't think we should. I think we have to be careful and make choices, as I say in, in, in the book, The Digital Aid. We've got to make those choices, but um, uh, this is a technology that can empower, not necessarily oppress. So you talked about the tradition that we have here in Europe, and um, I think one problem might also be that people don't know what artificial intelligence is, and that they only know Hollywood movies and have this you know, fear of artificial intelligence and how it can actually look like. Um, but we actually know AI is with us every day, with our smartphones, with other machines that we use on a daily basis. Um, so the question would be, how can we actually convince the public that it's not something that people should be scared of? And how can we include you know, the public to the debate of how how the future should look like. Well, I think you put it very well. I mean, the, the Hollywood depiction is often killer robots, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Uh, uh, occasionally, there's a, there's a different uh, formulation. But actually, the truth is that AI, as you say, is with us. It's been around and in our computing environments, in our cars, in our homes for quite a few years. We just don't think of it in terms of being the AI of Hollywood because it's not self-aware, malign, conniving machine. Rather, it's a speech recognition program or a face identification program, or it's a program to work out the quickest route between where you are now and where you want to get to given the traffic conditions. In fact, famously, a professor of AI, famous professor John McCarthy once said, today's AI is tomorrow's computer science. So that's the way we should think about it. And I think we do just have to explain that AI is not equivalent to building a self-aware, destructive, or a non-self-aware, completely destructive robot. As a computer scientist and AI practitioner, you probably know the trends of the upcoming years. And um, we know now that machines can be more intelligent than humans when we look at um, playing chess against a machine, for example. Um, but we always say it's not, it's not dangerous, it's not bad, because you, machines will never have the, the characteristics of humans. They can, cannot have feelings, they don't know empathy, they don't have emotions. So my questions would be, is that true forever? Do you see the possibility that a machine can actually be teach to have feelings, emotions, empathy, creativity, and all these human characteristics? Well, it's certainly the case that on about a 10-year cycle, and I've been working in AI for almost 40 years now, and about every 10 years, some piece of human expertise falls to the machines, and we have a panic, and then we all decide that the machines will take our jobs or replace us. And actually, um, what happens invariably is that a particular set of tasks become effectively solvable by machines. They become superhuman in those areas. It used to be chess, now it's go. What next? Actually, recognizing faces. Machines can recognize far more faces than any human could uniquely, far, far more. But that doesn't give them broad general intelligence. We don't actually agree at all on what broad general intelligence is. Um, we don't know very much about what gives rise to the sense of being self-aware or conscious. 
And as you say, the whole issue of emotional intelligence, being sociable and social, where is that? Whenever you open up even the very best programs, the AI programs, when you look inside the code, I always ask the question, what's not in the code? And almost all of human experience, as we understand it, isn't in the code. Could it ever be? I think it would be foolish to claim never, I, in some sense, because I'm a materialist. I, I believe that the human brain is an electrochemical system that has evolved through deep time, but it's evolved. And so is there no prospect of building an emulation of human thought or, in some sense, equivalence of general intelligence? Again, somebody once said that there are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. So why would we build something that's exactly like us? And uh, people worry about these systems teaching themselves and becoming super smart. But again, this still lives in very restricted domains as far as we know. This leads to our new, to, to actually to a new book, Digital Ape, um, in which you say it always happened thousands of years ago. We always invented tools, and the tools then shaped the world around them. And this is the same with AI today. We are shaping a new tool, and it shapes the world in which we live in. But my question would be: Is it not historically a turning point because there is the danger, or even the potential, that the tool, the machine, becomes more intelligent than the human that has invented it? So. That's my question. Is it not yeah. something that we don't expect now, that we cannot refer backwards, but how does the future look like? Well, I mean, one of the themes of the book is to remind ourselves, actually, that long before we humans were around, our hominid ancestors were making stone tools. They were changing their world. They changed the world around them. The oldest recorded evidence we have of that is possibly 3.3 million years. So for 200,000 generations before we ever turned up, technology was shaping us, literally shaping our brains, our neurology. So that's not new. And in fact, we don't actually know just how. We weren't there to see the changes that were affected. But we're getting more and more evidence that those sustained uses of tools and technologies literally changed the face of the earth. They could again. Our technology, not just the latest one, is entirely capable of wiping us out and has been since the, the emergence of ma we weapons of mass destruction. So we quite rightly worry about nuclear, biological, chemical weapons. We think about putting around various forms of treaty and control. And we will have to do the same, I think, for our um, computational and uh, um, AI uh, technology, or we'd be wise to think about it. Could the machines become smarter than us and decide to put away with us? Um, I think that's unlikely. I think for a long time we will have the agency to take the systems down or we'd be very unwise to give them decisions uh, making powers that could destroy us. But it's possible that we would be foolish enough. As I say, it's not the artificial intelligence that always worries me, it's some of our native natural stupidity. So if we make wrong choices, then we could be in a jam. And I think that the book spends a lot of time talking about our ability to be able to still make those choices. That leads us to um, ethics, to regulations, because you mention often that it's very important that we look at these aspects now in order to make sure that we have the future that we actually want to have. Want to have. Um, so my first question would be, um, why do you think it is so important? Um, you answered it already, I think, a little bit. But the second would be, who do you think is responsible to explore and include these, yeah. these aspects? Is it the industry? Um, is it the governments? Is it maybe the, the end consumer? Who, who's actually responsible to, to look at these aspects? I think if we, um, that's a great question. I think everyone, I think every stakeholder has to have some sense of both rights and responsibilities in this area. I think it's interesting to see just how often now the conversation around AI algorithms, big data, data science is around the ethics, is around governance, is around fairness. And I think that's a natural response. We want to understand that the, as an individual citizen or consumer, these technologies are not discriminating against me or working in support of me rather than against me, that I'm not having decisions made, the principles for which I don't understand, the consequence for which I, I'm not in control of. 
But that also goes for governments and corporations. It would be very wise for them to take these issues seriously and think about how we regulate and how we, in a certain sense, govern the use of these technologies. Where should it happen? It should happen everywhere, in civil society, it should happen in government, in the boardroom, and in our universities. When we're teaching our engineers and our computer scientists or our social scientists, we increasingly need to kind of make clear that there are ethical dimensions to what they do. To end at a more positive note, um, because as I mentioned already, you know the upcoming trends, and um, what is something we can specifically look forward to when we look at artificial intelligence in the future? What is something where you say the whole society will benefit from, and, and this is the, the one advantage that we always have to, to keep in mind? Well, there's a lot. In fact, I'm intrinsically optimistic. I'm very optimistic, uh, my co-author and I, throughout the book. Uh, we think it's too easy to fall into this dystopian model. And I think a lot of our conversation has been optimistic. It's been measured about understanding the responsibilities and taking the decisions seriously. But yes, we should remain optimistic if we make sensible choices. So think of healthcare. Healthcare is often advanced as one area where the ability to have a whole range of diagnostic software on your devices, on your smartphones, on your watches, in your devices, in your home, will give us a lifetime worth of data which will help understand, maintain, predict health, well-being, illness. I think that's a fantastically exciting opportunity. We'll see it in other areas. I'd like to think um, that as we put increasing amounts of automation into our transport systems, the evidence is that those systems get safer they actually get safer overall. As we seek to use AI in everything from the creative arts uh, through to areas where we're using machines together with human expertise and knowledge and understanding, this idea of augmented intelligence where machine human collectives can collectively, literally collectively, solve problems that the individual components can't. I think that's an exciting future. And the problems we're facing are big enough, they're the ones that should make you pause, whether it's climate change or whatever, that we will need the assistance of our smart devices if we're to uh, really secure all the possibilities going forward. Thank you so much, Sir Nigel. Um, we are very much looking forward to the de debate and input tonight because there's much more to come. But uh, thank you for the interview and um, yeah, hope to hear the input soon. Thank you so much, thank you.